policy underpinnings will help them in the very important process of setting policy priorities and strategies that accelerate and sustain growth. I want to emphasize something that's been said already, and that is we do not think there is a general policy or a core priority or strategy that that has to be done at the country level. This is more like a framework that uh, facilitates that process. And the reason we're interested in sustained high growth is not because it's the end goal. I haven't met anybody who gets up in the morning and cares about growth. It's kind of an abstract concept. They get up in the morning and worry about, you know, creativity, productivity, their children and grandchildren, their health, and other things that are really important. And the reason we focused on growth is, one, it's hard to do and sustain, and two, it is an important enabler of things that people really do care about, including many of the MDGs that are the multinational, you know, sort of agreement on what's important to get accomplished uh, in the next few years. The high growth cases are 13. They're listed here. They're, they exhibit a considerable amount of variety in everything from political organization uh, to how they went about it and so on. And as I say, uh, there may be many countries and regions that are about to join this. We all hope so, I mean, join this pattern. Uh, but the, the two clear cases that are it, it's just a matter of time away are India and Vietnam because of a sustainable pattern of uh, growth and recent growth and accelerations. This is not easy to see, and I'm, uh, but it is in the, in the report, and it is an attempt to, under, to summarize under five headings what we think the critical common ingredients uh, of these five, the 13 high growth cases are. So let me talk about them extremely briefly. Probably this, on the economic side, the single most important characteristic of these economies is they engage with the global economy. And that produces two benefits. One is knowledge, which is imported and increases the productive potential of the economy. Uh, advanced countries, as you well know, can't grow at these kinds of speeds because they grow by virtue of innovation and moving the production, productive potential of the economy out. And they collectively invent that uh, or innovate their way through it. And that produces growth rates that uh, run at the 2.5% a year range and sometimes spurred up to 35 or even 4 but certainly not 7, 8, 9, and 10. So that's the catch-up effect that enables high growth uh, and requires the global economy. The other key ingredient is global demand. So in, a relative, in early stages, a relatively poor economy has demand that's A, small, and B, in any sector, even smaller. And what happens in the global economy is if you can find a sector in which you have some kind of comparative or competitive advantage, then global demand is big enough relative to almost all developing economies to allow you to grow at very high rates. And in, in, in a simple sense, the model is linear. You grow at rates that correspond to your ability to invest on the public and private sector side. 